from a larger spiritual perspective, there are no victims. There are no villains. There are circumstances and situations that allow you to learn more about yourself. Stress keeps us from seeing the bigger picture because literally the stress reaction in the body puts our nervous system in a state where we don't have access to the part of our brain that gives us the ability to see the bigger picture. The whole point of doing inner work on a consistent basis is to give us access to a new perspective. It's a higher aspect of ourselves that's able to project the broader picture and see where we're going, what obstacles may be in the way, to see what opportunities may be around the corner that we would never be able to perceive otherwise. And that's the power of doing inner work. Now you may be asking, how do you know? How does it happen? And the reality is, it's been a while since I've done one of these solo episodes, so. I'm excited to come back here and to talk about a new project that I'm going to be starting very, very soon. Um, and maybe by the time you're watching this, the project has already started, but just a little background. I've been investing a lot of time and resources into building out my YouTube channel about, I don't know, a year and a half ago, we started posting the a video version of this podcast on YouTube, and it's gotten such an amazing reaction. It's grown very quickly that I have, um, I've just been excited about putting more resources into, into YouTube because it, it adds a different element when you can actually see the conversation versus just hearing the conversation and. I'm also moving closer in the direction of creating an in-person studio uh, here in Mexico City where I'm based and starting to record live sessions as opposed to doing it on um, remote platforms, which is how I've been doing them pretty much exclusively. It's funny because the first podcast that I ever did was a live session. I just did it from my phone and now Obviously, so many podcasts are doing in-person sessions that it's, it's kind of become the new norm for sort of the higher tier shows. And meaning if you're not doing it in person, then you're not, it's going to be very hard to get to that, that higher tier where you're able to attract, uh, the guests that you see doing the rotation of the higher tier platforms. We've even had a lot of guests that we reach out to reply back to us, Hey, when you're doing an in-person show, let me know. And I'm happy to do it. Otherwise, um, I'd rather not come on to a podcast with a remote interview. So it's something that's definitely in the zeitgeist and people look at it as a form of content creation as well. As you get these really beautiful clips that you can post on your social media and help to spread your message. And let's be honest, that's part of the deal with hosting a podcast is you're not doing anyone a favor and they're not doing you a favor. It's a mutually beneficial arrangement where you get to have these amazing conversations and share insights with your audience. And that audience, you know, stays with you and ultimately converts to maybe, you know, buying the book that you publish or, or enrolling in the course that you have. And the guest gets content. They get to share their message. They get content. And so everybody gets something from the, uh, the transaction, which is a, it's a beautiful thing. If there's going to be a transaction, you may as well be getting something beneficial. That's positive. That's leaving the world a better place in the process. So creating the best possible product is definitely one of my goals simply because it's better for you. You enjoy the content better and then it's better for the guest. And ultimately it's better for me and my team because we get to operate at a higher level and a higher standard for ourselves. So that's pretty cool. And one of the initiatives that we're creating, um, is a new series 
on my YouTube channel, which is going to be called the spiritual perspective, the spiritual perspective. So as many of you know, I have been a long time meditation teacher and practitioner. I think it's over 20 years now that I've been practicing meditation, nearly 20 years that I've been teaching meditation. And so a lot of the content that I put out there and to a large extent, my perspective, even when I'm giving interviews, it's coming from more of a spiritual, um, context, meaning I've been in this, in this mindful slash spiritual slash transformational space for so long that that's kind of how I see the world now. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that I'm not able to understand more sort of, I'll call it ground level perspectives of things, which is more of a sort of linear approach, right? For instance, if we're talking about relationships and I'm giving relationship advice, or if we're talking about politics and I'm giving political advice or whatever the, the situation is, the ground level perspective is what happened who did what to who, um, who's being affected by it, right? That's the ground level perspective, who, what, when, where, and why. And if you don't address everybody's, you know, unique life experience, a lot of times you'll get, you'll get feedback in the comments. Oh, that's limited. You didn't mention this, that, or the other exception. Um, and they use that as a way to put into question the whole argument. Whereas from a spiritual perspective, you're taking more of a, of a broader perspective, right? It's, you could call it the 30,000 foot view of any given situation. And so while someone may be experiencing, um, the role of the victim and someone else may be experiencing the role of the perpetrator from a larger spiritual perspective, there are no victims. There are no villains, right? There are circumstances and situations that allow you to learn more about yourself. And that takeaway that you may have from the experience is, oh, I've been playing the victim or I didn't have strong enough boundaries or I have done that to someone else before in the past. And now I get to see what it's like to have it done to me. So that's, that's, that's the broader perspective to an ordinary life situation. It's not that you're bypassing what happened. It's that you're just looking at it through a larger, broader lens. And this is a very intentional thing that we can do. And, you know, oftentimes when we read quote, spiritual books, like The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle or The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz or uh, Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh and or the Bible or the Torah or the Quran. A lot of times these books will echo the same general principles do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And they resonate deeply. You know, we hear it, we read it and we go, yeah, that's right. That's, that's definitely how I would like to be. It's aspirational, but in day-to-day -day life, we tend to get caught up in the ground level experiences, which is that this person did this horrible thing to me. And that was so screwed up because it stopped me from achieving whatever my, my, uh, goal was for that day. And I don't like that. And so therefore our conclusion is that person is the bad guy and I'm the good guy. Right. And we can read doing to others as you'd have them doing to you. And naturally we just, we just automatically assume that that person is representative of an obstacle that I need to overcome and I need to get them out of my way. And if they do something horrible enough, then 
I'm going to put them on my crap list and it's going to be very hard for me to forgive them. And because it was unnecessary, whatever they did was unnecessarily bad, right? Again, I'm just generalizing here, but that's basically how we tend to interpret those experiences. And it gets reinforced by our friends and by the media, you know, they're the good guys and they're the bad guys. And, and so we don't see anything usually inappropriate about that kind of interpretation of what happened. And so reading those books gives us an intellectual understanding that, well, maybe there are deeper laws that are governing all of this and that maybe there is a purpose behind the situation that happened to me that would allow me to see a different side of things. And, but if it's just a matter of reading the books, then that's pretty much where it's going to stay is as an intellectual concept, which means next time it happens, we're going to react in the same way, probably because we haven't embodied these principles. And so at some point, when we call ourselves spiritual practitioners, we need to practice these concepts. We need to practice incorporating them. And, or at the very least, we need to get rid of the things that are stopping us from embodying them. And the umbrella term for those things that are stopping us is stress. Stress is what keeps us from feeling like I am connected to the other person or to the situation. Stress keeps us from seeing the bigger picture because literally the stress reaction in the body puts our nervous system in a state where we don't have access to the part of our brain that gives us the ability to see the bigger picture because that's been genetically hardwired to not happen in the event of legitimate danger, which means we're being chased by some predator. And if we stop running to see the big picture and oh, this is, this is happening for me, not just to me and all that, we get eaten by the predator. We get attacked by the predator. We potentially die. So our ancestors who escaped from those predators were the ones who could run the fastest and fight the hardest. And so those genes are the ones that we ultimately inherited. We didn't inherit the person's genes who was trying to negotiate and reason with the tiger. We inherited the person's genes who was up in the tree, the fastest and who fought and maybe who used some sort of clever manipulation tactic to get away from the tiger at the expense of someone who wasn't as clever, who was used as a decoy and got attacked and killed by the tiger. So that is our inherent nature, meaning the nature of the physical body that we incorporated when we came into this plane of existence. We got these bodies that have already been programmed for re reacting to perceived stressful, dangerous situations, high pressure situations, high demand situations, um, in a fight flight capacity. And when that is running on autopilot, then again, it, it reinforces the idea that this person is against me. This person is trying to kill me, trying to attack me, trying to stop me from surviving, from thriving, from being alive, from having all of the wonderful benefits that life has to offer. And it's a dog eat dog world and zero sum and nobody cares. And so. All of these, uh, truths that it, it's very hard to deny if all you ever experience in life is the ground level perspective. And so enter practices like meditation, breath work, gratitude, et cetera. In other words, inner work, the umbrella term for all of that is inner work. So enter inner work into our lives. You could even add, I guess, plant ceremonies and stuff like that, medicine journeys. What the whole point of doing inner work on a consistent basis is to give us access to a new perspective, 
to a, quote, spiritual perspective, to a higher, broader perspective on life. And so when we go into our meditation practice, when we do our breath work, when we sit and list the things that we're grateful for, when we engage in the medicine journeys, we are able to shift in our awareness away from the ground level perspective where it's who, what, when, where, why dominated. And we go into a broader perspective and that broader perspective is it, it gives us the ability to see threads of connection. It gives us the ability to see patterns and themes and cause and effect. And it's kind of like, you know, when you're walking around and you look down on the ground and you see this little ant and you imagine this ant is, you know, in, in the ant world, the ant is going across the grass or the blade of grass or the cement or whatever. And that blade of grass must look like the whole world to that ant, right? Or the cement must look like the Atlantic ocean to that ant. But from the broader perspective, you can see that the ant is crawling towards, you know, um, another patch of grass or it's coming from this other patch of grass. You could see the ant farm, perhaps that the ant came from, you could see where the ant is going. You can see what obstacles are going to be along the way. And you can see things that the ant may not be able to perceive from that ground level. Uh, perspective that could be beneficial to the ant or could be detrimental to the ant. And so when we talk about spiritual, the spiritual perspective, it's kind of the same thing. Instead of being a force outside of ourselves that is able to see our individuality on the ground, it's like it's a higher aspect of ourselves that's able to sort of project the broader picture and see where we're going and see what obstacles may be in the way to see what opportunities may be around the corner that we would never be able to perceive otherwise from the ground level. And that's the power of doing inner work. Now you may be asking, you know, how do you know, how does it happen? And the reality is, I don't know. I don't know how it happens. I don't know the mechanics, I don't know how you would even measure that scientifically to find out how you're able to tap into this broader perspective from closing your eyes for 15 to 20 minutes a day and sitting quietly or from breathing, you know, deeper than you would normally breathe, but with intention on a daily basis or from sitting down and writing out 10 things that you're grateful for in your normal everyday life. But somehow, some way, when you engage in those kinds of activities, it opens your awareness up to be able to perceive things about yourself, about other people, about life that you would never be able to perceive otherwise if all you ever experienced was the ground level perspective of life, right? Your day to day, going around, doing your to-do list, scrolling through social media, um, reading people's captions and watching television and gossiping and driving around and just exercising and doing all the things. That's great. There's some wonderful benefits that can come from all of that, but you will never have the level of access to the larger themes in your life that you would have when you dedicate a meaningful amount of time out of your day to doing your inner work. And that's the power of the inner work. And it's kind of like trying to describe to somebody what a strawberry tastes like, who's never even had fruit before. It's impossible. You just have to taste it for yourself. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions and look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. And so I've been fortunate enough to, you know, I've crossed paths with, with 
lots of really bad teachers, meaning they were probably having an experience for themselves, but they weren't able to show me how to be able to have that experience for myself. They complicated it, in other words. And I would say that that's still a good situation because it helped me appreciate the good teachers that I met. I met a few really talented teachers who were able to show me very simply how to tap into this inner world and, um, and teach me practices to be able to continue accessing it without needing them around for me to have that experience. And so in that sense, from the spiritual perspective, there's no such thing as a bad teacher, right? Because the bad teachers help you appreciate the good teachers. So the bad teachers are as important, I would even say fundamental to your process as the good teachers are. The bad experiences are as fundamental to your life as the good experiences are, because you won't, you won't appreciate the good experiences without going through some rough and rocky experiences. And so again, that's just a, that's just a little sample of the spiritual perspective it, from the ground level perspective. Yeah. That teacher sucks. It's awful, you know, and you spend all this time and energy focusing on how bad the experience was without realizing that this experience is going to come into play one day when I meet someone who's very talented and I'm going to be even more engaged in the talented teacher because I had this really awful experience with the bad teacher. And so in that sense, there is no such thing as a bad experience. Good and bad, these kind of binary terms are functions of the ground level experience. So if you're using that a lot in your day-to-day -day language, it's because you have mostly only been exposed to the, the ground level experience and maybe an intellectual understanding of a spiritual perspective, a broader experience. And so it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to seek out more of that, more of that broader perspective, just to give context to the things that you're experiencing. Again, not for the sake of, you know, having this sort of kumbaya relationship with things, but for the sake of making yourself more present to what is around you. Because when you're focused on what's not happening, for the most part, you're missing out on so much on so many other things that are happening. And that's what it means to see around the corner. That's what it means to see the themes and the patterns in your life. You can't do that if you're so hyper-focused on what's not happening. And that's how most people are living their life from day to day. They're just focused on what's not happening. They're worried about what may or may not happen. All that means is they don't have access to that broader level perspective. So this is not some kind of woo-woo, airy-fairy aspiration. This is a very real world practical benefit so that you can reduce the worry, you can reduce the anxiety, you can reduce the depression if you can see where you're going and know why you're going there. If you can see and know why, then you, you have less of that sort of childlike temper tantrums. You know, when you have children and you're driving around with young children, all they think about is they want to play. Oh, I want to go to the toy store. Oh, I want some ice cream. I want some candy. And look, there's a time and place for all of those things, right? But as the adult who's actually driving the car, you know that, okay, we're going to, you know, this destination, we're going to grandmother's house. We're going to this destination. All of that is going to be there that they're looking for, but they keep getting distracted by what it's, what's glittery outside of the window as the car is moving in that direction. And all they're thinking about is short-term gratification. And as the parent, as the more mature person in that scenario, they also want some cotton candy, want to stop and go and play or whatever. But you know that you have to keep moving the thing forward so that everybody gets whatever they need from that situation. So you're not just thinking about yourself. You're also thinking about their needs. You're thinking about their nutrition. You're thinking about their development as children. And so you're having to make sacrifices that they're never going to understand. Right. And so to say that someone is spiritually mature means that you learn how to do that for yourself. You learn how to parent yourself away from 
short-term gratification, sitting there and scrolling through a social media for two hours. And instead, towards understanding your long-term nurturing needs, right? I'm going to carve out some of these two hours that I would otherwise be scrolling through social media for my inner work, because I know that allows me to expand my awareness. And when I expand my awareness, I'm less distracted. I'm less anxious. I'm less depressed and I'm more present and I'm more grateful for the things that are around me. And I'm able to see how life is happening for me and not just to me. So I'm able to have the the benefit of the ground level perspective and the empathy that comes with that and the relatability that comes with that and that broader 30,000 foot view perspective at the same time, right? That's, that's master level experiences. So it's not even just enough to have the broader perspective, but you want to have the broader perspective that's integrated within the ground level perspective, because if you only have access to the broader level perspective with not a lot of ground level perspective, then you end up getting crucified for that, right? I'm using that term kind of loosely because if you read the Bible, that's what Jesus experienced, right? And this is, again, this is not, I'm not anti-Jesus or pro-Jesus or any of that kind of stuff. I believe that um, a lot of what was written about Jesus still resonates with me and with a lot of other people today as truth, right? As a sort of a higher level truth, doing to others, all the Beatitudes and Sermon on the Mount and all these wonderful things. And at the same time, one could make the objective argument that Jesus had separated himself from, quotes, normal people so much that normal people could no longer relate to what he was saying. And so when that happens in, in life, whether it's 2000 years ago or today, whenever someone stands out in that way, because they're not as relatable, the byproduct of that is usually people want to induce pain within you to see if you are like them or not. And that's what I mean by saying, you know, you get crucified. So it could be your views that get crucified. It could be your body that gets crucified. It could be all of it that gets crucified. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't be more Christ-like um, or more like Martin Luther King or more like Gandhi or more like Malcolm X or more like Cesar Chavez or whoever is out there who's trying to make the world a better place in their own way. But there's a consequence that comes with that that will in introduce elements of pain into your life that probably would not happen if you were more quote normal, right? And that's one of the things that Martin Luther King said to his lieutenants in the later parts of his life, which, you know, as he was assassinated when he was 39 years old. So this happened when he was like 37, 38 years old. He told his top lieutenants one day, he says that you can't truly be free, a paraphrase, you can't truly be free until you overcome your love of wealth and your fear of death. If you're still attached or overly attached to wealth in order to be comfortable, in order to be happy, in order to feel fulfilled, then you're never going to be free. Because what he was ultimately saying is that happiness and fulfillment are inside out phenomena, right? You have to cultivate it from the inside out. And typically that happens from putting yourself in a situation where you're doing uh, what you feel is the right thing. And then fear of death. If you're afraid of being crucified, you will never give yourself permission to stand out, to speak up, to separate yourself from the, the pack too far because that's what happens. That's what happens. People will... Uh, resist you, people will rebel against you. The very well-meaning people will do very bad things in the name of justice, right? And that's why we can all go see a movie like Avatar and we can all be on the side of the, the avatars when you see the mean corporation coming in and trying to destroy 
their natural environment to look for uh, res natural resources. We can all kind of agree that, oh yeah, those are the bad guys and the avatars are the good guys because we're hearing the story of the avatars. It's told from the perspective of the avatars, right? But in real life, it's much, it's a much more gray type of area because you'll have, like, for instance, what's happening in the Middle East in 2024, you know, starting on October the 7th in 2023, you have people who are supporters of Israel. You have people who are supporters of Palestine and both feel like they are on the side of the good guys because of the stories that they're telling themselves, mainly from the ground level perspective. So who's to say if they're right, if they're wrong, if they're missing this, if they're missing that, it's all up to your subjective experience, right? If you're a black person in America and you've been subject to discrimination, probably you are going to empathize with the Palestinian cause. And it'll be very hard for you to understand the cause of the Zionists. Likewise, if you, if your grandmother was in the Holocaust, if, if you have lived in you know, Israel and you've experienced that culture and Shabbat dinners and stuff like that, probably you are going to empathize with the side of the Zionists and the protection of the Israeli culture and, you know, all of these things. And it's not to say one side is necessarily, or it's, I should say, inherently good or bad because both and all sides really are a function of the stories that we've told ourselves about what those sides mean. So it's hard to identify who exactly is the villain and who's the victim, especially in real time from the ground level perspective. So our opportunity as spiritual practitioners is to tap into this sort of broader perspective. And here's how you know you're able to do that. You're not assigning one side as the good guy, one side as the bad guy. You're able to see various qualities in both sides, right? You're able to see various qualities in both sides. You're able to empathize with different aspects within both sides because what you're actually seeing when you're looking at it from their spiritual perspective is you're seeing multiple sides of yourself. You're seeing sides of yourself where maybe you feel like you were disenfranchised, right? Perhaps as a, a woman, as a black person, as a poor person, as a disabled person, as an uneducated person, right? As someone who is addicted to something. So that aspect of you allows you to relate to the disenfranchisement. And then the other aspect, people who have taken the time and the care to cultivate their identity and their culture. They've escaped some bad experiences. They've empowered themselves, right? It's aspirational. And so maybe a part of you is able to understand that as well. Uh, having people taken away from you and held in captivity, whether in abusive relationships or um, it could even be emotional captivity. So the point is not to assign blame, but just to identify with various aspects. And, and then within that, you may be experiencing some sort of calling, some sort of directive, right? In other words, how can you personally, individually contribute to the conversation from the perspective that feels most aligned to who and where you are right now? And that may be you posting on social media, right? You starting a conversation. That may be you writing a screenplay or writing a, a, a play. That could be you writing your memoir and sharing your perspective. I have a friend uh, who I actually interviewed for, on, on this podcast. Her name is Dedeen. Dedeen was in the Rwandan genocide. And she was a teenager when all of that happened. And, you know, many members of her family were slaughtered. And Many of her friends were killed and she fortunately survived that horrible, horrible experience. 
And she ended up writing a book about it. She ended up giving talks about it. And now that's what she's known for is someone who is the voice of, you know, what happens when we see the worst in each other and how to overcome that. And she is credible because she's actually been through it. She's had the experience. She wasn't the only one who had the experience, but there was something within her that called her to document her real life experience and to speak about it. And I'm not saying it was easy to do that. It's not easy to write a book. It's not easy to give a talk, but when you have that calling and you do something about it, you're not assigning one side as good and the other side as bad. You can see multiple sides of a situation, right? You can see sides of it that are positive and constructive. And you can also see sides of that situation that are negative from a ground level perspective and destructive, but there is no overarching good or overarching bad. And that just becomes the way you, you can see these situations. And again, I know a lot of people may translate that as, oh, you're spiritually bypassing, you're, you're purposely not focusing on the aspects of it that are not serving your sort of spiritual woo woo airy fairy understanding of these things so that you don't have to do something about it. And, and that last part, that's where the spiritual bypassing comes into play is in thinking that there's nothing to do about it because I've convinced myself that there are good elements or good aspects to everything. And that's not, that's definitely not what I'm trying to communicate, right? Some people just, again, using this conflict in the Middle East, some people feel called to do something when they, when they watch the news and they see what's going on over there. But at the same time, they may watch the news and hear about what's going on in Sudan. They may hear about what's going on in Myanmar. They may hear what's going on in the Congo and they feel nothing. They feel, oh, I'm sorry that those people are having to experience that, but it doesn't drive action in the same way that hearing about what's happening in the Middle East drives action. And why is that the case? Because when we talk about concepts like purpose and passion, they are linked to our own direct experience karmically, right? There's something in our karma that is causing us to feel like we should respond in a certain way to specific situations, but karmically, we don't have that same, um, connection to other situations that may be just as detrimental, if not even more detrimental. Do you know the main cause of death on this planet? The main cause of death on this planet is not war. It's not people doing mean things to each other. The main cause of death on this planet is starvation, right? Starvation. In other words, more people are dying of starvation than anything else. And it's not even because there's not enough food available on the planet. The reason why more people are dying of starvation than anything else is because there are not enough distribution channels for that food. And there's probably all kinds of other nuanced aspects of the food supply chain on planet earth, probably having to do with capitalism, probably having to do with politics, probably having to do with even things like religion that are causing these bottlenecks to occur around the world. And you have massive populations of people who are on the brink of starvation, who are not getting enough to eat and who are ultimately dying of not getting enough to eat. And yet, even though you just heard that, you may not be compelled to do anything different because of that. And so, you know, the spiritual sort of understanding of this is that 
you don't have to try to fix everything because that's, that's a aspect of, of your ego that makes you even feel like, oh, I can fix all of this. From a spiritual perspective, this is the broader perspective now. The understanding is that, oh, that's not an isolated event, right? That's a pattern. That's a theme. And in some way it ties to my day-to-day activities, the way that I spend my time, the way that I spend my money. And so instead of me feeling like I have to put on a cape and go out and try to solve the whole problem in the world and putting that kind of pressure on myself or putting that pressure on any one individual, what I can do is I can be more mindful of how I spend my time. I could be more mindful of how I connect with other people. I could be more mindful of how I respond to what I see on social media. I could be more mindful about how I spend my money, right? And in that way, we sort of integrate within our day-to-day, moment-to-moment activities, a solution that works for us. And that allows us to continue doing the things that we are most excited about, right? Because you're here, and this is, again, this is the spiritual understanding. You're here for a broader purpose that may be exciting to you, but it may do nothing for me. It may, I may hear about it and I go, huh, that's good for them, right? I have no desire to, and this is just an example. I have no desire to go to a soup kitchen and, and serve soup to unhoused people. I have no desire to go and work at a, at a animal sanctuary, right? But some people are, are, they, they, their heart lights up so much at the idea of working with certain populations of people, of working with animals, of cleaning up the beach, you know, what excites me is this, doing podcasts, creating content that helps to inspire people to find their purpose. Like I literally will go to bed at night and wake up in the middle of the night because an idea came to me for something that I can post on Instagram that I think can help give people a greater, a broader uh, perspective of life. And I will literally pick up my phone in the middle of the night and open up my notes app and write it down so I don't forget it. And that happens to be, that happens to me multiple times throughout my day, right? That's what lights me up. But someone else may think, oh, there's no way I'm going to pick up my phone in the middle of my sleep and write down some idea to post something on social media. Like, why would I ever do that? I may pick up my phone and scroll through the social media to, to entertain me, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to pick it up in the middle of the night so that I can write down a quote that I want to post. That sounds ridiculous. And that's fine for that to sound ridiculous to them. That can exist, right? And that's another part of the spiritual perspective is that multiple truths can exist. They can coexist in our awareness all at the same time without one having to necessarily cancel out the other one. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way, I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right? Thanks so much for your feedback. And back to the show. In my book, Knowing Where to Look, I talk about that concept of multiple truths existing. For instance, and I use an example of the ocean. And I say, you know, the ocean, someone may say the ocean is, is very wavy and it's, it's, it's liquid in nature, which I think most of us would agree with. But someone else may say, no, actually the ocean is flat and it's still, and it appears to be solid, right? Now you may ask yourself, well, what do you mean the ocean is flat? It obviously is not flat. Obviously it's not still, it's definitely not solid, but it depends on where you're looking at it from. If an alien was in orbit around our planet and that was the closest that they came to the planet. It's just being in orbit, being a hundred thousand miles in orbit. 
around the planet, they may see that blue object as a still solid object because from space, it looks like it's still, it looks like it's solid. You cannot tell that it's liquid, right? Even from an airplane, 30,000 feet up, if you're flying over the ocean, it looks solid It looks still. And it does not look wavy or like liquid, but from a ground level, or in this case, from the sea level, obviously it's not solid. It's not still, but let's say you were a microorganism and you were in one of the water molecules, right? That was a part of the ocean. You may consider the ocean to be solid, right? For all we know, the earth is a molecule in a larger universal ocean that we can't see or experience because we're too small to see or experience. So the point is, it depends on the perspective that will tell you what the nature of a thing is. And all you can really speak for is your perspective. You can't, you can't discount or invalidate someone else's perspective. And that's one of the other key tenets of a spiritual perspective is that it's the understanding or the acknowledgement that truth is different in different states of awareness. So someone could be watching an event unfold and they're in one state of awareness, which means they have access to more than just the ground level state of awareness. And they're able to see things and feel things and experience things that someone else who is maybe only able to experience the ground level perspective is able to see, feel and experience. And so the report of quotes, what happened between those two people may be different. And usually what the ground level person is going to end up doing is getting into a, a fight or a disagreement with the person who's able to see multiple layers of experience. And if that person who's able to see multiple layers is mostly at the ground level and that's been dominating their, dominating their experience, then the idea of fighting may seem like a very useful, necessary way to spend their time. But if you've been stabilizing that higher perspective, that broader perspective, the 30,000 foot view, and you still have access to the ground level perspective, then the best idea that you have in how to respond to this person trolling you or trivializing or invalidating your perspective is silence right? It's not worth your time or attention. And you're just going to let them have their experience and you don't have to get in the comments and invalidate their experience and uh, tell them how wrong they are because they're not going to probably understand anyway, because they only have access to that ground level, who, what, when, why, where, uh, type of experience and, and awareness. And so, um, that's, that's, and that's fine. It doesn't have to be anything other than that. And that's another thing. When you have that broader perspective, you don't have to play, put a judgment on it. You don't have to call them stupid. You don't have to call them, um, ignorant. You don't have to call them anything. They can, it can just be what it is in the same way that you may observe the ant or the spider or the grasshopper. You don't have to get into the personality flaws, the character flaws of the grasshopper or the ant, because it seems like they're walking in the wrong direction, right? Because they're just having their own little innocent experience from the ground level. And again, another spiritual, uh, understanding is that everyone, all of us, we're all moving in the direction of greater and greater, uh, evolution. So no matter what level we're experiencing life at, we're all moving in the direction of greater awareness, right? And, and what life is doing is it's continuing to meet us at whatever level of awareness we have currently stabilized. So it's not like you get to graduate from the challenge of life. It's that your, the things that are challenging you will evolve beyond whatever's going on at the ground level to whatever's happening on those uh, more expansive levels. So maybe somebody in the comments trivializing you or invalidating you used to get you upset. Now it doesn't really get you upset anymore, but the idea of not enough people having food in the world gets you upset enough 
to baby step your way towards some sort of, you know, local solution to that. And, um, and so that's what you start to put your attention on and people can say whatever they want to say on your social media posts. It doesn't really matter to you where someone who's kind of stuck at that ground level, they're spending a lot of their time and attention going back and forth. Um, with whatever people's opinions are around the things that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Which it's better than physically fighting them. So maybe they've evolved beyond that. So we're all kind of moving in the direction of our own personal growth and evolution. And that's another understanding that we have from the spiritual perspective. So all that to say, my new series on uh, the spiritual perspective is going to address um, the differences in the ground level and the 30,000 foot view on a variety of topical issues, such as, uh, conflicts, such as politics, such as relationship dynamics, such as personal goals, such as health, wellness, and all of the things that I typically don't talk about because I tend to talk about things from that perspective. And I feel like it needs to have its own sort of container so that when you're consuming the content, you understand that you're going into this unique perspective and, and, um, and it's not necessarily going to align with whatever the more conventional understanding is, which is also a good thing because it's just going to give you a different perspective. And it's not necessarily going to be one that you agree with, but maybe one day, um, as you continue doing your inner work, maybe you will start to appreciate the nuances of that spiritual perspective as you understand it, as you relate to it. And, um, and maybe you'll even have something to add to it or contribute to it, right? Because everyone's access to that spiritual perspective is going to be a bit different and we're, certain people are going to pay attention to certain things. Like when we're all in an airplane and you have, you know, 200 people looking out of a window, everyone's kind of looking at different things. Some people may be looking at the clouds and studying that. Some people may be looking at the stratosphere and studying that. Some people may be looking at the wing of the plane and studying that. And so depending on what you personally feel called to study, is that's going to inform how you uh, contribute to the conversation and how you participate in the conversation. And so far, I haven't really seen that. You know, I've become a big fan of YouTube and YouTube channels over the last few years, and I haven't really seen a lot of people offering what I consider to be the spiritual perspective in a real world practical way, right? You got your woo woo types and your airy fairy types and all of that. And that's fine. There's a there's a time and place for that. There are people who look for that, who, who love that kind of content. Personally, I consider myself to be the healthy skeptic in the room when it comes to spiritual concepts and practices. I, I always identify as a sort of meat and potatoes, uh, spiritual practitioner slash meditation teacher. So I'm looking forward to bringing that to the conversation and inviting you to come and participate to whatever extent you would like to. But yeah, talking about all of these subjects through the context of real world concerns, real world experiences, kitchen table conversations that people typically have. What are we going to do about the conflict in the Middle East? What are we going to do about, you know, dating with dating apps? What are we going to do about um, raising children? What are we going to do about following your passion and purpose versus having a conventional job and all of those kinds of things. Is voting important? So look for me to post videos a couple of times a week about all of these topics. And within that, threading in the themes of people doing their best and how truth is subjective and how um, everything is one thing and how uh, your status quo is a reflection of your standards and all of these different spiritual principles, um, as they relate to very normal, normal life circumstances. And it's, 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 uh, it's an exciting extension of all of the other things that I've been doing. We're still going to keep the podcast going as it is. 
uh, with the plot twists and the long form episodes published every week. And this will be on a different channel, mainly on YouTube, but we'll also publish the audio as well. Uh, but we're going to get started first with the YouTube series so that you get the visual element, which I think adds something to it. Again, I've become a big fan of YouTube, so I'm, I'm really into that visual element. So yeah, definitely check that out and like and share and comment and subscribe to my YouTube channel to whatever extent you can. And I look forward to fulfilling more of my purpose in creating this content for you and for myself, because I learned just as much from sitting down and sort of channeling this stuff. I don't consider myself to be the author of it, but very much the channel of it. And, uh, and that excites me because I don't oftentimes know what's going to come out and I try not to, you know, overthink it. I just try to just speak and I may have some bullet points down or, you know, we'll have written some notes and things like that. But for the most part, it's, uh, it's something that's coming through me and I've been doing that for years now. And, um, so I'm, I'm excited to share that with you. All right. Thank you very much for tuning in again to this solo episode. And, uh, and I will notify you for those of you who are on my email list, I'll notify you of when the first uh, spiritual perspective episodes will be dropping. All right. Look for that in the next week or two. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.